Back in 2010, class of 1950 alumnus Roger Mudd, an extraordinary and well-known journalist in America, gave the university a generous gift for a center that would look into important ethical issues. At the time, back in 2010, Roger Mudd said, given the state of ethics in our current culture, this seems a fitting time to endow a center for the study of ethics, and my university is its fitting home. That's what Roger Mudd said in 2010. It was true then, it's, it's definitely true now. The center plays an important part in the life of the school by choosing a topic every year, a broad topic of ethical importance. This year's topic is the ethics of technology. Not a day goes by without all of us reading in a newspaper or on the internet something about the technological revolution and about the many issues um, that that revolution has brought about. Such things as gene editing, altering human DNA, artificial intelligence and robotics in the workplace and elsewhere. Um, big tech firms like Facebook and Google and the other ones, their practices, their handling of private information, uh, issues relating to cybersecurity, in which in a number of noted situations people have hacked into seemingly secure institutions. So we pick that broad topic, the ethics of technology, and we began then to put together a schedule of speakers from outside the university and from within some of our own talent. And we've come up with a very exciting, I think, schedule for this year's ethics theme. Our keynote speaker is a bioethicist, lawyer, and scholar and researcher into the whole area of gene editing, gene modification, altering of human DNA. And her name is Josephine Johnston. She's the head research scholar at an entity called the Hastings Center in the state of New York. She has a new book coming out called Human Flourishing in the Age of Gene Editing. So she's bringing a philosophical, ethical perspective to some extremely important scientific developments. We've all read about the Chinese scientist who some months ago said that he had altered the DNA of two microscopic embryos that later developed into human persons and are now born. The question of what are the ethical limits of such practices. And Josephine Johnson is going to lead us through the evolution of that question over time. And then she's going to pick a specific application connected to gene editing. She's going to look at the good parent in our culture today. Does the good parent alter the genetic makeup of its children? Does the good parent look into all of this? Does the good parent do anything? Uh, to make use of sec technologies. How should we think about this? What ethical values should be part of the culture's consideration of this topic? We're very excited about that as the kickoff um, speaker for this year's series.
Okay, I think we can get started. Good evening. I'm Alicia Swayze, the Reynolds Professor in Business Journalism. Thanks for joining me this evening for a conversation with Sue Craig and Rachel Abrams of the New York Times. <laughs> so, that was good, thanks. Um, good start, okay. Both Sue and Rachel covered the intersection of power and money. Sue did something that eludes even Congress. She got 10 years of IRS transcripts of Trump's tax returns. It all started in 2016 when Sue found three pages of his tax forms in her Times mailbox. This led to an 18-month investigation that proved Trump's family business used fraudulent accounting to dodge steep tax bills when diverting millions to Donald and his siblings. Rachel broke news about Les Moonves' misconduct, and she is now co-authoring a book about his ouster as head of CBS. Rachel was also part of the team coverage of Harvey Weinstein's abuse of actresses, stories that fueled the global Me Too movement as more women came forward to tell their stories. Both Sue and Rachel have won the Pulitzer Prize, among many other awards, for their tireless pursuit of the truth. Please join me in welcoming them to Washington and Lee. <laughs> Sue, you told me that you started out as a night cops reporter, and yet you ended up covering the street for the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. How did that come about? <laughs> well, I was, I was covering, uh, I was working in a small town in southern Ontario in Canada, and I'd been there three or four years, and I really wanted to move to Toronto, to the big city. And the only job I could find was a one-month contract job at a paper called the Financial Post. And the offer was to cover, of course, business. It's the Financial Post. And I left that job to take this one-month contract. And the only thing I, I, it was like, I knew nothing about business. You know, what I kind of knew about it, I thought it would be really boring. And I didn't even know when I, I had to cover an earnings story on my first day, and I didn't know, like, net income was profit. It was doomed for failure, but <laughs> it, it worked um, in the end. And I just, I fell in love with business reporting, because I realized it's, you know, it's a key, it's, just, it's not about numbers. It's about mm -hmm. personality, and it's about, you know, power and, you know, people and personality and when they intersect. I always remember when I, I finally, after I worked at the Financial Post, I got onto the Globe and Mail, and then I worked, I applied forever to the Wall Street Journal, and I finally got an interview there, and I went in for my final interview. And it was with Dan Hertzberg, then deputy editor at the Wall Street Journal, and he had me down to his office. It was down when the Wall Street Journal was by the World Trade Center. And you could see when you looked out his window, the New York Stock Exchange, and as he was talking to me, he got all pointed over at the Stock Exchange, and he said, power, money, and greed, what more could a reporter want? I never, I couldn't have said it better, and I still believe that. It's just an incredible Absolutely. world to cover, and I, 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 I love it. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear? Okay. Oh. Maybe that's a... Yeah. Really good. Thanks. How did you do that? I actually unplugged it and did it, but... Oh. Or moved it up. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll try to speak up. Um, Rachel, you started your career at Variety, which is the Hollywood Bible. So how did you end up chasing down business stories? Um, so when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to watch television. And so when I got to Variety, which is a trade publication in Hollywood, which means it makes its money off of um, stories about deals, actors getting parts, new movies, new projects, they would often send interns, which I started out as on the red carpet to interview celebrities. And because I hadn't been allowed to watch TV, I, never, I could never recognize anybody. I didn't know who anybody <laughs> was. I was constantly making an idiot out of myself. And I thought, I have to find something I could cover here. It's like, I need to figure out some way to carve a little niche that can make myself useful. 
Um, and nobody at the time was really interested in covering the, how movies were financed, like who paid for them, who the bankers were, what the studios were doing, where they were finding money. And so, and the great thing about this part of the, like, the world was that, um, was that when you called a banker in LA or when you called an entertainment finance attorney, nobody, they would all answer your calls because nobody yeah. was calling them because nobody was interested in this. Yeah. So I was getting my, my calls answered by like the most important people within this world, the people that were making Spider-Man happen, the, 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 the guy with the billions of dollars behind some Marvel movie. And so it turned out that this was the one area at Variety where I didn't need to know who anybody famous was. <laughs> and it turned out to be something that once I started writing about it, um, the Variety was like, wow, actually, yeah, this is a great area for us to start covering. And it ended up that they sent me to um, the Allen & Company conference. And Variety had never sent anyone to the Allen & Company conference, mm. which if you don't know what that is, it's a big conference that happens every year with like big muckety mucks in finance and tech. So Rupert Murdoch goes, Mark Zuckerberg goes. And it was there that I met people at the New York Times and made some connections. And uh, that actually eventually led to, to my job at the Times. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, do you watch television now? Oh my God, I know so what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? A certain TV show on Sunday nights. It was the, the scene is modeled after. No, what were you going to? I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh there's show? a big, there's a, there's a, in succession, there's a big conference that happens and it's modeled oh, after. Succession. Oh, succession. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. now I'm That's dialed in. No. You know, this is kind of free form here as it always <laughs> is. Anyway. All right, so yeah. I watch a ton mm -hmm. now, and it, my parents plan just for all the parents that they're totally backfired because now I watch every reality show on Bravo. So just, <laughs> just so you all know. And she recognized Sarah Jessica Parker yes. the other night too. So okay, <laughs> all right, serious now. <clears throat> so Sue, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, you proved Off. the U.S. president committed fraud, but no one got indicted. He's still in the White House. So what was, from your point of view, the impact of that story? It's interesting. You get, I get that question a lot about, you know, you write a story, you, the, we've shown that the president and his family engaged in fraud, and he's still there. And I, I think when you, I, I think your people are really, and they were looking for a cause in effect in it. Mm -hmm. and, I think it's sort of in this immediate world, and, and it would have been great if, if everything had lined up and there had been a big congressional investigation. But I think a lot happened after that story, and I, I think in addition to investigations being started on the state, there's a city right. investigation, a state investigation going on. Um, Donald Trump's sister, who was a judge, stepped away from her status as senior judge in order to avoid an investigation into, into her conduct. But I think more important than that, and I, I think it sort of drives to the importance of investigative journalism and the time that was spent on that piece and others, is I think that that story really has changed the narrative of Donald Trump. And, and I think forever when it's told, you know, I think we all know that he made, you know, he got a little bit more than a million dollars from his father. And we, you know, kind of got that, but to show and what the story showed that over, you know, his whole life, he got hundreds of millions of dollars from his father. And a lot of that was achieved through tax fraud. That that fortune, you know, was was greater because of that. I think it's changed the narrative of of the of the man in the White House. And I think it's also been, just as a reporter who covers this stuff day in and day out, it was amazing to me that we could we could start a project on somebody who's already in the White House and find out 1,500 or sorry, 15, 14,000 new words on his biography. Right. I mean, it's just incredible that none of that really, very little of it had been at all, you know, mm -hmm. reported. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the New York investigation is ongoing. There's a city and a state one looking at the taxes that were paid on some of, you know, we found some of the, the buildings that they had valued, that there had been a lot of undervaluation in the city and the state are looking into whether back taxes are owed on that. A lot of it though, and it's important, it happened a long time ago, it's outside of the statute of limitations. So I don't think we had an expectation going in that it was going to you know going to immediately cause any sort of resignation or or an immediate criminal investigation but i think for us it was really important that we you know that we set the record straight given everything we found that was contrary completely to to what we had found it it goes to the you know there's a there's a saying that a lie passed down into history becomes truth 
And that's what Donald Trump did by repetition for years and years and years about talking about, you know, he was a self-made man, he barely got anything from his father, and eventually that just seeped into the public as fact. It was repeated in newspapers and articles over and over and over, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I think now everybody knows that's about the furthest thing from the truth there is. Right. And then in May, you came back with another story based on 10 years and this, my favorite line in the story was that you got the documents from someone who had legal authority to have access to them. And that was a real stoplight to me in terms of, oh, legit. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Got any more? <laughs> Just curious. We're, 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 uh, I should give out the mailing address so that people know. But we're still, we're, you know, we've got another, at least another year, and we're going to keep going to find out more information about his finances. You know, we've done a lot now on the finances, kind of up until 2003 and four, and that's, yeah. and now we're looking at hopefully moving it into the more modern finances, which I still think are really murky, and that's what we're kind of working mm -hmm. on now. I don't know where it's going to lead us, but we're, uh, you know, we're still every day trying to figure out more about it. And we appreciate it. Um, Rachel, uh, you have done some amazing work where you've had to interview victims of sexual assault. And so many stay silent. How do you encourage them to talk to the Times? Um, is this, everyone can hear me? This is on? A little louder? OK. Um, I think. The first, the most important thing is that you have to make people feel comfortable and you have to make people feel like they can trust you, that you're going to listen to them. Um, but I think also, I mean, all, all reporting, whether it's sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. whether it's what Sue does, whether it's a d t different beat entirely, it's all relationship build. It's all about relationships. Uh, will people trust you? Will people trust you to tell their story accurately and give them a voice, which is all, that's what we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to give a voice to people that um, might not have one otherwise. But on top of that, I think it's really important, because I've never worked on a story that was so closely tied to a social movement the way that this is, and a lot of people are looking at journalists right now, um, really projecting a lot of things onto these stories. They want journalists to be advocates. They want journalists, there's, there's a whole, there's a mentality out there among some people of like, go get them, go get the bad guys. And, and you know, I, I, of course I want to think of myself as Lois Lane in some respects, but you know, we're, we're uh, fundamentally, we are, pe our, the, our only power comes from being, um, just telling the facts, not editorializing, we are not advocates. And so we have to explain to people, including, including some of the people who want to tell us stories about being victimized or about, um, about sexual misconduct, we have to explain that we are not here to advocate for a certain policy change, we're not here to go get somebody, we're here to figure out what happened and tell that story in the most compelling, accurate, and fair way possible because that is the power of journalism. Other people can point to our journalism and try to advocate from it, but our job, and the minute somebody thinks that we are advocates ourselves, that we are angling for a certain position, we lose all, all power because you, t you immediately tune out a whole bunch of people that already want to dismiss you as fake or biased, right. so. yeah. And you really did give people, you were commenting at lunch about uh, one of your colleagues said a, a safe place to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Yeah, really I think for, for Rachel, when I look at some of the work that our, our team has done on sexual assault victims, it's really hard when you have a situation where usually the two people who are witnesses are the victim and, and, and the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And they're really hard stories to get on the record and it takes a lot of patience and working with people who've been victimized and then finding you know, witnesses who can corroborate it at the time. And it's just a very slow, patient thing. I've watched Rachel work. I've watched Jody Counter and Megan Tui work. I, I sit back, you know, near them, a lot of the Me Too reporters. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's really hard and slow work mm -hmm. to gain that trust. And we yeah. do have the benefit of, I would say, because after Weinstein, women that I talk to now, I, I have the benefit of these women have seen the Weinstein stories, the Bill O'Reilly stories. They've yeah. seen that people have spoken publicly and have been okay. And mm -hmm. it, they've seen that, that those women often, I mean, 
every single person I have ever spoken to, and I say women, but there have been a few men, but it is, it, it's it mostly mm -hmm. women. Everyone is just so glad they shared this and overwhelmingly they feel fulfilled that they were part of this. They felt like maybe they couldn't change the past, but by speaking out, they were doing, making some positive impact on the world. Maybe they had helped somebody by sharing their story who thought they were so alone. So I think we have the, hit, we have the benefit of Jody and Megan, all the people that have already been doing this work. Yeah, exactly. And it, I mean, it really did all of that fuel a global conversation for so many people. Sue, um, you, you deal with a different issue, and that's the, a barrage of denials and, let's face it, outright lies um, anytime you have to contact Trump's people. Um, how do you deal with that? It's, it's tricky because we, obviously we spend a lot of time, and I would say by by starting out by saying, you know, we tax returns are really difficult to get. The president's tax returns are hard <laughs> Congress, to get. Congress and then couldn't do it. <laughs> the next hurdle we have is trying to verify them, and it can take months, if not longer. And we do a lot of things, including going to, you know, publicly available documents that we have, and then, you know, things that we have that that aren't public that we try to get, just to see, you know, and to keep stress testing the information that we have, and then. At some point in the process, and, and I'll talk about this story that we did in particular in May with my colleague Russ Butner. We went um, after we had spent a lot of time, and we felt we we were ready to go to press. We felt very confident in the information that we had, and in that case, we had um, information from uh, IRS transcript that gave us 10 more years of Donald Trump's tax returns. Um, and we at one point phoned the, we have to phone the White House, and we engaged with um, Donald Trump's tax attorney and another attorney, Jay Sekolo, and we got an immediate denial that the information was just demon it was demonstrably false. We didn't believe that, but when you have a pre-publication denial, it just puts yet another burden on the paper, and we, we had a discussion about it, and our editors said, well, let's go back, and we're going to do more work to get more evidence, even though we were confident at that point, and it just... It's hard because you know it's right, and they, you know, are putting a hurdle in front of you when you have accurate information. They're just saying you're wrong because they know it's going to put another several weeks, at least, in front of you of work. And we eventually um, did go to press, but not after we had yet another round with Charles Harder, who is the president's outside attorney. He also happened to represent Peter Thiel in the Gawker case, Gawker you know, against the Hulk Hogan lawsuit. Um, Gawker ended up getting shut down. That is the primary attorney we deal with now when we have to deal with the president. And he again phoned us to reiterate that the information was wrong. We went to press. It wasn't wrong. We knew it. Um, but it's frustrating because you sort of think, you know, I think they take in a way, they take advantage, I think, of our, our fair-mindedness and our, our, you know, pursuit of being fair. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it's hard because you can't not when you hear the White House saying your story is wrong, you know you have to really calibrate that and think about it and go through everything one more time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so you both have to confirm very difficult information. So how do you get so much of it into print? I mean, and a lot of it is time, more time, more time. And on the on the case of the tax uh, returns. You had mentioned how you even used an extra step about with the National Archive of um, anonymized uh, uh, tax returns. But I mean, I marvel at how much you are able to get into print. Yeah, in the, in the case of the tax returns, we we've had different. Um, in the in the case of the um, the ones that were mailed to me in 2016, in that case, it was and it took only 10 days. In that case, we had three pages, and you know, everybody when they came in were pretty skeptical, but we wanted to try and confirm them. And in that case, there was three signatures on the uh, the tax return: Marla Maples, Donald Trump, and an accountant named Jack Mitnick. And we were fortunate after we the first step we did though before we called, you know, there's three parties, and we decided Jack Mitnick was probably the one we should go to. But before we did that, we did a lot of work just trying to understand what was in the tax return. Right. So we have one shot at this. So when we went down to see my colleague David Barstow, you know, we got the tax returns on a Friday. We spent four or five full days. We had experts come in walking us through what the numbers meant. Um, and then we went down to see Jack Mitnick and he ultimately confirmed 
that he was the signator and that and and had other uh, other identifying things that he told us that we were certain that this was in fact his 1995 Donald Trump's 1995 tax returns but it can get really it, it, it's difficult i mean that was like a great 10 day 10 day story that worked out but we have spent in the case of the the May story where we had 10 more years we spent 6 or 7 months and we did everything in that case. We had um, started out just by going to publicly available data. Um, the Casino Commission at that point in the years that we had had a lot of publicly available data that we could compare it against. But we even, we also had, because we had done the 18 month investigation um, into Fred Trump's empire, we had a lot of financial information that was not public that we could compare. And then after we got the call and the denial from the White House, we went back one more time and at some point, we were just, you know, in our research, we realized that the IRS, and we had known this before, but the IRS releases anonymized data of taxpayers. We'd run across it a lot in studies we had read. And in this case, you know, it's sort of like looking at everything afresh because the data was anonymized, but in this case, we now had a taxpayer. So we were able, and in the, in the case of the data that we we, the anonymized data we found, we found it off in, in the National Archives. We got it for free, and we were able to, in that case, at least identify a taxpayer who matched identically to the information that we had from the tax returns we believed to be Donald Trump's. That told us simply that there was another taxpayer out there that matched the data we had, but with everything else, that was kind of the hurt, that was the step that put us over the goal line on that story. And it was, it was like a long, long days of trying to, you know, just puzzle that out every day to try and get those 10 years to press. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, a story about a sexual assault or misconduct or harassment, um, there's often, it's sort of the opposite because there's often no proof, no evidence, no documentation, no witnesses, because a lot of the stuff that I rep have reported on happened between two people and, two, and only two people in a room. So... One of the things, sometimes there is, sometimes there is some kind of documentation. For example, um, there maybe some, maybe there are text messages. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe the person texted their best friend at the time to say, "I cannot believe what just happened to me." Maybe they filed a complaint with someone, maybe an employer, or they sent an email to their boss. Sometimes there are some kind of documentation, which is always sorry, diaries. Diaries. Maybe somebody got. Maybe somebody wrote something contemporaneously. Um, uh, but oftentimes there's nothing, right? Yeah. And so. One of the things that we ask is, did, did you tell anybody? Did you tell, I mean, one of the things I uh, helped with on Jody and Megan's Weinstein story was uh, talking to the people that those women had said they told at the time. So was it somebody's father? Was it, um, was it someone's best friend? Was it an ex-boyfriend? And you call and you just say, and you tell and you, I, you tell women I am not doing this because I don't believe you. I you know I'm doing this to protect both of us because if I am diligent and fact check your story, then I make sure that nobody else can come after us and say you didn't do a good job and therefore the New York Times is careless and reckless and the story could be wrong, and that I didn't make some stupid mistake because maybe you know you say it happened on a Tuesday, but everybody could have looking at a calendar would know that it's a Wednesday. So what else did the New York Times get wrong? Well, there's a saying around the office. If you can't get the small things right, then what are the big, like, you certainly can't get the big things right. Um, so oftentimes what it comes down to is you call up the person that, you know, some, uh, somebody tells you they told and you say, could you, I, I understand you might have heard about this incident. Can you just tell me to the best of your memory? You know, I'm not looking to catch you in anything, but can you just recount this for me? Can you narrate for me what happened? And oftentimes you just have to be very clear with the audience that you don't have anything more than that. You don't have any text messages, you don't have a complaint, you don't have a photo, you don't have a tax return. And, um, and I think when you're clear with the readers about what you have and what you don't have, and when you're really transparent about that, it makes you seem more trustworthy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, I know just from the time when I was doing this uh, full time, and what you do now, the, the process has become much more transparent to readers because there's, there's a more detailed explanation in terms of and often sometimes a little box that says how we did this. You know the interesting, I, you're right about that. And I think the inter we've done that on the tax return stories. And the amazing thing about that writing, just writing that paragraph every time we have to say that the person was in legal possession and here's what else mm -hmm. we did, you often see that you don't have enough to explain to the reader and we need to go back and do more work. We struggle with those paragraphs, but we want to be really transparent. But as a reporter, it also lets you see 
you know, where potentially the holes are and that maybe we need to go back and do some more work. Exactly. And we've had those conversations in the newsroom. Yeah. yeah. Trump's attacks on journalists have created a, a rather hostile environment. Um, have you had extra security training in the newsroom that you can talk about? We, we have. It's, it's really unsettling, I have to say, when you think just even from three years ago what we go through now. At the times where we have to go through active shooter training um, and we, we learn just where to go if a, if a shooter comes into the newsroom. What you're supposed to do, you're supposed to run. If you see somebody who's injured, you need to keep running, and it really, you should get to the closest exit. If you can't, you know, which room should you go to, and they walk you through all of that. But in addition to that, it's just, you know, there's been police barricades that are now, now outside the New York Times. We have to work with the hotel rooms or the hotels around the New York Times just to make sure that their security is up. I sit at a window, they're worried about sharpshooters that could be at the hotel across the street. Um, and in addition, now just even when I travel, I have to go through security protocols. When I cross customs, I have to, I'm, I can't bring my computer anymore. I have to have my phone shut down. Um, when I go through, uh -huh. I, now, I now know when my phone can be imaged and when it can't, depending how long. You know, if I've just turned it on, it can't be imaged until I put my passcode in. Um, I lock down all of my apps. Um, you know, with you know, with security, so that they're not open because you can't image them. Then mm -hmm. I just I, the list goes on and on of things that just wouldn't have occurred to me three or four years ago. And it wasn't that we weren't careless three or four years ago, but it's a real wake-up call. I mean, I never thought I would be sitting in a newsroom in in the United States going through active shooter training, and it, it was a you know pretty much a cause and effect of, of the hate speech that comes out of the White House. Mm -hmm. Have either one of you gotten any threats? I, I, yeah, I get them occasionally, so. No, I, I sort of don't, you know, you, you have to just be, be aware, I guess. I don't kind of internalize them in a way that it changes my day-to-day -day life, but you're certainly a lot more aware, mm -hmm. yeah. No. I, I, not, not really, I mean, I also have that mute thing on Twitter where Twitter can just filter out all the people that seem crazy, hateful, or threatening, mm -hmm. so I don't know, maybe. But I have nothing, nothing mm -hmm. that's mercifully. But I also don't cover the president. Right. So you guys, I think, really bear the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. Rachel, you, you've spoken about uh, the importance of finding allies because newsrooms, especially the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, can be rather intimidating places, um, especially when you, you first are hired. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Sue did? to help you navigate that when you first started out and now? Yeah, so I started the Times five years ago and I was terrified and I had only worked at a trade and I didn't know anybody and I just moved to New York. And Sue was obviously a well-established journalist who the first day I walked into the newsroom, stood up, introduced herself, asked me how I was, asked me who I was, and then from there proceeded to help me would give me suggestions for stories to read, um, made time to have coffee with me and help me kind of navigate like, who do you need to talk to for what and who's who in the building and you know, here's who, our, who we report to and just a little bit about them. And since then, no matter what you have been working on, has never been too busy to answer my question of like, I need to get this person to talk to me. I'm thinking of knocking on their door. What, what would I say, what, Sue, what do you think is the best thing to say to them as soon as they open the door? Sue has never been too busy to give me advice. And for all of the things that the Times talks about investing in, one of the most important things is, is free, which is encouragement and time. And a little bit of validation, it's, it, this is what's, I really hope that, it's, that at some point I'm in a position to like pay this forward. You will. Be, because, yes. but, um, <laughs> but I just feel like having somebody say to you, good job, uh -huh. that you did a nice job, I like the way you approached that, it, when you are new and you're nervous and you're insecure, it does, it goes so far into making you work, be confident enough to do good work the next time around. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, I, I don't think I would have accomplished half of what I have at the times if I didn't have Sue and I didn't have friends. And I, you know, I, I, I'm sure that there are people here who are in a position to be mentors 
and I just want to let everybody know that it makes such a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Now, was that an official mentoring uh, program that you, you know, everybody adopts the, the new kid or? No, was... no, not. I mean, I've participated in the mentorship program at the times, but I, Rachel was just a great reporter and I could tell I'd heard really good things about her. And, you know, I just, I think if you, you know, it raises us all. And I also mm. think I've learned a lot from Rachel. She's a, an incredible reporter and a great sourcer, and I often go to her for advice on stuff. So it's definitely a two-way street. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wasn't that nice? Aww. Yes, it was. No, it's really important. It really is, because I, I tell that same thing all the time. It's like, it, it is. Rachel says something really important. It is, and I think no matter where you are in your career, a little bit of encouragement can go a long way. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially yeah. with what we do, there's a huge microscope on us, and, yeah, and I yes. think the tendency is to focus on the negative, sometimes rightly, but it, it can really wear you down, and especially yeah. when you're covering the sort of topics that we are, we're constantly under fire, and sometimes, you know, it's just me, and it's just Rachel, and we're like trying to sort stuff out, and yeah. just having someone either say, it's gonna be okay, or you did a great job, mm -hmm. and it, it matters. You know, it's interesting, because um, social media has obviously changed the dynamic of the newsroom in terms of, you know, I never thought there would be anything but a group of editors coming together to decide what's the news agenda for today. And, um, and then it became, well, what's the latest tweet? Is it hard to stay focused on long projects when you're dealing with so many people who have the attention span of a tweet? I feel like you're the best person to answer this. No, I mean, because it's, you, journalists like to, you know, be busy and in print, but you also know there's a great payoff in the end. I'm going to just keep working at this, head down. It's like writing a book. I right? find it just more of a distraction issue because I'm not, I mean, I love, and, I, you know, I've done a lot of daily news reporting. I'm not yeah. doing that now. I'm doing more investigative stories, but I think it's just a constant distraction, and I think that that's sort of what you have to actually guard against actively. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to check your phone every two minutes, and you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to check Twitter, you know, once a day to see what's going on. If, you know, I on my beat, but I'm also not, and I'm not participating on Twitter very much. But mm -hmm. but but by I've made a conscious decision not to, because mm -hmm. um, I think if you don't, I mean, I think your your day, you can spend it how you want, and I think you need to say I've got an opportunity today to do so much, and mm -hmm. we're doing really important work, and I I don't want to squander that by doing, you know, mm -hmm. being on Twitter and having fights with people who I don't know. It just yeah, is like I've made exactly. a decision about that. Um, and I also think from a source point of view, just sometimes you send a tweet out and you'll offend somebody you don't even know. And it's just that, that could be important. It could be watching and, and maybe wanting to come to you with information. And that's information that you've lost that you'll never know. Mm -hmm. So I'm being, I'm just really careful, but yeah. even more so lately. Yeah. Because I just see how many people that have like just unintentional errors on Twitter and it's just not worth it. There's just so many new platforms where we can embarrass ourselves, yeah. so. <laughs> and, and that has happened yeah. uh, recently at the Times. I'm, I'm gonna let somebody in the audience bring that one up. Um, so for the students here uh, who want to become journalists, what advice do you have for them? Um, just take every opportunity. There is nothing too small, there is no, a uh, story that isn't worth doing. It doesn't matter whether it's for your school newspaper. Don't forget, um, oh my God, the Penn State, the big, uh, is Jer yep. Sandusky? Wasn't Sandusky. that, a, wasn't mm -hmm. that the, for the school or the local paper? I, I'm pretty sure the woman that broke all of that. Um, yeah. You can do so much just by like, just be, it because you want it. And if you're hungry, you, you should just take every opportunity basically because that's, I know that from experience and um, if anybody offers you a hand, take it, because you never know who's going to be ultimately helpful. You don't know who's going to be in a position to hire you in five years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the advice when I look back at my career, I think it's taking risks. I, I left a, a really great job in Windsor. It was a union job. I was doing well for a one-month contract, and it really... I think set the tone for my career. Not only did it get me to Toronto, it got me into business reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think taking those sort of chances when you're young, because you can't necessarily do them when you're older. Um, that's what you know. That's what I would do if I had like one piece of advice in my career. And I also think mm -hmm. specializing yeah. um, really helped me. 
I was a police reporter, and there's a lot, a lot of people who were doing that. And I think once I got into business reporting, I found just the ability to. It's, it's served me well throughout my career. When I look at both, I got, I went on to cover Wall Street, but even when I, after I covered Wall Street, I covered the governor of New York for two years, and I knew a lot about finance. It helps when you're covering state government to have that. And then the reason that I got brought on to cover the president was because I understood both politics and I had a long background in covering business. Um, so every day that, that specialization in business reporting has just been really important to me. Can I actually add one other thing? Please. Um, I, I had no interest in entertainment reporting and, and that turned into an opportunity that I could mold to fit my interests, my skill sets. And I would also say that not to worry if the first thing that comes your way that will pay you something is not your passion, is not what you want to cover, is not what you're interested in because there's a good chance that if, once you get your foot in the door, you could say, well, I'm, I'm really interested in like this little piece of it. And you can create a beat for yourself. And newsrooms, I feel like a lot of people succeed, not everybody, but a lot of people do succeed because they started covering something that their paper or their blog or their outlet didn't even realize they wanted or needed. Mm -hmm. And you just, you just need to kind of get in there and then you can make your own luck and opportunities. Absolutely, yeah, and be tireless and keep a pair of running shoes around too. Rachel, like. Rachel actually got hired by the New York Times to cover Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> How's that working out? <laughs> Don't do it anymore. <laughs> when, she, when I first met her, she, we were talking about, it was, we were talking about Goldman Sachs was one of the companies that she was gonna cover and I started talking about retail banking and she looked at me and she says, what's retail banking? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're, we got a like, learning curve here. And but. to Sue's credit, she didn't say, you know what, I'm not gonna bother with this person anymore because- No, I told you, you what retail banking. Yeah, she told me, she explained it to me and yeah. gave me some homework assignments and I read all of them and it was great and I learned. But embrace fresh eyes too. I mean, it's, you, people come in and they don't know what it is and maybe they, you know, they're asking a lot of questions about it and they stumble on stories. I really Absolutely. believe beat reporters should not be in a beat for a long time. I think, you know, you can do it for five or 10 years. I did Wall Street for 10, 10 years, but I then volunteered to go cover the governor because I really, I wanted a hard change and I, yeah. and I did that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, bringing new people in is great, and we learn from them, and we see new stories from them. Mm -hmm. No, 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 stupid questions, only stupid answers. That's right. Um, so I think we're just going to open it up to the audience now, and I'm sure there are plenty of students here, who are, as well as all, all of our other guests, who have questions for you. So, yeah, I'm back. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, uh, I'll be great. Uh, my question has to do with what your thought process is in situations where people might be claiming uh, rights to privacy versus the value of accountability. So for example, um, I, on record, would say I'm in support of releasing Trump's tax returns. But of course, if, if well, someone were to release my or probably any ordinary person, so to speak, tax returns, they'd say, hey, you violated my privacy. Now with Trump, he's a, the most public figure, and there's the most public interest that he's most accountable to the public. So I'm just wondering, in these type of situations, how you ba uh, balance these two values between claims of privacy versus value of accountability. I, I, you know, and I think you made an important point in all of that, that he is a hugely public figure, and he has basically claimed he has a right to privacy, and I, I would say from our point of view, we also feel that the public has a right to know and we're gonna to continue to look for the taxes, but I think that that's the balance. I mean, I think he's gonna to continue to maintain that they're his taxes and they're private, and we're gonna to continue to look for them because at the core of it, I think it comes down to a question is, why, why should his taxes be public? Why should this information be public? He is the head of the government, and he is making decisions every day that affect a huge amount of things, and we don't know what pressure is being brought to bear on him financially because we haven't seen his taxes. We don't know who's paying him, essentially. I think there's a huge public interest in that, to know that, and so we're gonna continue to go after it. But I think the balance, you know, I think that that, in our view, outweighs his right to privacy. And, and on the flip side of that, if we find out that somebody has been um, the victim of a sexual assault or misconduct, and they don't wanna talk about it, uh, we're not going to put their name in the paper, or if they don't, you know, if they don't basically, if, if somebody is a victim and they're a private citizen, mm -hmm. and you're weighing the public's right to know and the public interest and the public good of that, um, then in our case, you don't. It, 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 in your case, it does outweigh somebody saying, you know, these are my tax returns, and in other examples, we say, you know, we're not going to, 
we're not going to put in the paper. The, there, there's, the calculation goes both ways. And I, I think in the case of, of the president, too, there, there's a precedent that goes back decades of presidents releasing their tax returns for the express reason of us understanding where their money is coming from. So I think you have a, a precedent you know, behind our view that you know, we want to see more of his taxes and we're going to continue to report on it for that reason. Well, and it's interesting because you and Dave Farenthold have been on panels. He's the reporter from the Washington Post who spoke here a few years ago. He was the one who broke the story about he didn't give much money to charity after all, as in none. And he talks a lot about how it's important to see who's doing business at the hotels because we want to know, don't we, if the Saudis are renting out the hotels all the time, and, or the, the yeah, Russians and we want to see if the Saudis are for, which of his companies have foreign partners, and what country are they mm -hmm. from? You know, there's a lot we won't learn from tax returns, but there is a lot about the money that is coming in, and we're going to learn who it's from and where it's from, mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to. I think you're going to understand potentially a lot of the decisions he's making, and are they based for his own personal interest or for the for the public good? Yes. yes. Um, in regards to the Harvey Weinstein case, how did you persuade the first person to actually come in and open up about it when they could be very scared that even Harvey Weinstein or someone from their team could come back after them, knowing that they're gonna that you're gonna go out and publish this? Um, so the question, just to repeat it, so in case others didn't hear it, is um, how the Times managed to get the first person who was a victim of Harvey Weinstein to come out and start talking about it. So I didn't do any of that work. Uh, that early was early on. That was that was that was early work done yeah. by Jody Cantor and Megan Tuey. I came in for a much smaller task at the at the end and helping to corroborate. But because I know them and I, I heard a lot about their process, I, I will say what I know about how they did it and from they just came out with a book that kind of goes into some of these mm -hmm. details. Um, and to sum it up I think one of the most important things they had to impress on these women, and it's something that, an exercise that I've had to go through with different stories, is trying to get a group together, right? Somebody will start talking to you and they'll say, I'm really scared to go on the record, um, but, uh, but if you can get three other people or two other people or one other person to, say, to go on the record, I'll go on the record. If they give you their name, I'll give you my name. So a lot of times you start these conversations when people are just learning to trust you, and, and you start to get them at least to open up and tell, them, tell you their stories, and then slowly, slowly, they start coming around to the idea that, of having their name in the paper if they're not alone. And we always tell people there's strength in numbers, right? Like, it's much hard, like, if there's a group of you together, you know, it's much harder to attack any one individual person. Um, and I, there's actually, in their book, there's a really great anecdote about Gwyneth Paltrow, um, mm -hmm. because they were starting to talk to Gwyneth Paltrow, who, was very nervous about going on the record because she was having a PR nightmare because Goop, which is her lifestyle brand that people love to hate, uh, was selling these like bogus jade eggs for oh. women to promote spirituality, and she'd been she'd been made fun of everywhere. So this jade egg scandal was sort of the I told you the hidden villain of the Me Too movement that you know made her not want to go on the record. But they but they they ultimately got Ashley Judd as the I, the first. Correct me if I'm wrong. You right. but is Ashley Judd was the first victim to go on the record. And I sat next to them and watched them report for months. And I remember they couldn't get anybody on the record. And the editor finally came over. And they had a lot of stuff. But ultimately, they had nobody on the record. And she says, we don't have a story until you do. And they finally convinced Ashley Judd to go on the record. And I remember that was like just a, the water, just the dam. And it just started gushing after them. I mean, once they had her on the record, other people started coming forward. But it took one person to get the rest, and it's just a long process of trust and of, of those women believing that it's gonna make a difference. But that, that was a long road to that day. Well, and then you did come in then on some of those stories, but then with the Les Moonves uh, stories in terms of you were in on that from the beginning. And I remember one of the stories was about it'll be okay as long as Bobby doesn't talk. Yes, yeah. we. Um so we wrote a story called If Bobby Talks, I'm Finished. And it was about how this manager was trying to extort Les Moonves uh, by, ex by saying that he had a client who had an, an allegation against Moonves and mm -hmm. they needed to keep her quiet by getting her work. And by the way, can you get work from these other people I represent? And in that case, 
we had, it was unusual because we had a lot of text messages, but uh, maybe a better example is when we were able to look at this report about his misconduct that was prepared by CBS's law firms. Mm. That report had a ton of names in it, women's names, victims' names, some of whom I had already spoken with who had wow. refused to be to refused to go public and to this day refused to go public. Mm. And so the Times had to figure out, even though there's a document here, um, and we could just we could point to the document, like uh, this is not a public document, the public interest in this is we, can, we have to discuss how, how we're going to use this information. And ultimately, the way we handled that, for instance, was um, I went back to all those women. They still didn't want to talk. And so we decided we were going to make, we were going to broadly characterize some of the allegations in the report so that nobody who didn't know who these women were beforehand would be able to identify them based on what we published. Um, and it goes back to if they're not willing Right. To talk Absolutely. to us. The paper doesn't want to re-victimize yes. people. And, and that, that's always at the front of your mind when you're dealing with those situations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all the stories you talked about tonight, you mentioned months of you know building trust and verifying information that turns to these long investigations. How do you balance doing that process and verifying information with the fear that another paper is working on the same story and might break it first? Um, well, I guess, I don't know, I think other people at the Times might disagree with this. My personal opinion is when, after Weinstein, there was yeah. such a flood of tips, such a flood of people who wanted to talk to us. I, I had the mindset of, like, there is so, so much to go around. Like, there's just so many of these, there's so many stories and not enough reporters right. that... I wasn't really interested in, like, I didn't really, I didn't really worry about another paper competing with, and, and the one time where I was put on a story because we heard the LA Times was also working on it, so we really, I, I know I'm being taped right now, but, you know, I thought that maybe, maybe I should work on a different story, right? Because, like, let, 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 let this other, let, let, let the LA Times or whoever it was, let them have this one because we can, now we can focus our few journalists on some other story. And so, I think that with, with Me Too, it's a little bit different, um, but maybe, I don't know if you want to talk about the... I think with the, with the tax returns, and I, I particularly had that concern in 2016. When we, when we got the, you know, when the three pages were mailed to me at the New York Times in 2016, this was six or seven weeks before the election, and just to put oh. everybody back there, I mean, the, getting the ta any tax returns of Donald Trump at that point was like the Rosetta Stone. There was dozens of reporters chasing this. And we got three pages mailed to us. Like it could have been fake, it could have been real, and yet there was. And we also didn't know if, and it turns out, another newspaper was mailed them and couldn't get them to publication. But our concern through the whole thing was simply that we that we're going to go to press. We better be right because we're all going to be unemployed in the morning. And I think it's just like doubling and tripling back. And it, in that case, I remember we had a real concern about the three, the three pages that we got, and it was 1995, so that he wasn't, Donald Trump wasn't e-filing at that point. These were filed by an accountant, likely mailed into the IRS. And there was discrepancies in the numbers on his, he had a net, net operating, it was a very large net operating loss, but it wasn't the same type all the way. It was clear like a typewriter and a computer had done it. Um, and so the fonts were different and somebody could have liquid papered it and changed it. We didn't know, but that was like at the back of our minds that this, this document was likely doctored. And we ended up talking to the accountant about it and the accountant, when we asked him about this, remembered right away why that was. And the reason why is the e-filing system, the TurboTax at the time that he had used, could not actually fit a net operating loss as big as Donald Trump's. It was 900 and some million dollars. So he had to type in the last three digits and he, you know, he told us the typewriter that he did it on. So all these things that we had doubt about ended up being confirming. But that night when we went to publication, I remember talking to Dean Bacay before, you know, we made the decision about five or six o'clock on a Saturday night to go to press. And I pulled Dean over and I said, let's just go over it one more time because you know, we all knew what was at stake and, and you know, we decided to go, but we went through everything one more time. Because it, it is really, it's hair raising. If we get it wrong, it's, yeah, there's no taking that back. And, and, and you're, I'd prefer to be second 
than, than to rush it through because I think the Washington Post is also working on it. And maybe they've just outreported us that time. But I, I just think you can never be rushed into, into publication. Second and right rather than first and wrong. Or first and right if you're not confident and you have yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, people. If, yeah, sometimes you just have to let it go and say we couldn't do it. Uh, Sue Craig also is a testimony to checking snail mail uh, in this era of uh, digital communications and suddenly everyone at the Times. I have to say that it's a kind of a joke around the Times that I check my mailbox, but if you want to get tax returns to somebody because there's so much jeopardy if you're giving them to somebody, mailing them seems to be the way to do it. So I check my mailbox twice a day still. Um, actually, yeah, it's... I started checking my mailbox because of Sue, and I started getting anonymous tips mailed to me that was were extremely helpful. <laughs> You're now offering free stamps, right? Yeah. yeah. I want to do an I want to do an ad campaign for the uh, United States Postal Service. Yeah. <laughs> They'd appreciate that. They, they've had some bad press. Uh, right here. Earlier about how journalism and news media has changed significantly in like the past four to five years due to like the Trump administration and like Twitter and stuff like that. And I was just wondering where you guys see it going and how you think it will evolve later on. Her question is, um, they've seen a lot of change, obviously in journalism with social media and in the Trump era. And where do we see this going in the future? Sure, I, it has changed a lot. And I think you've seen a rise, um, particularly since Trump of you know, the personality of individual reporters. You know, reporters have contracts on CNN, on MSNBC, and, you know, they're on Twitter a lot more. And I think it has created, you know, it, it's a more immediate atmosphere. And I think at the same, I just sort of feel like while we're on Twitter and all this stuff is happening really fast, I think it's really important that papers and reporters st step back and, and just see the value of investigative reporting because I think. Both are important, we have to cover the White House, but sometimes it's just even when you're covering the White House, step back sometimes and even just when you're doing that, ask, you know, should I be on Twitter as much? Or maybe you should be, but I just think asking that question is a core question for younger reporters is really important and do I need to say that on Twitter? Or, you know, sometimes it's important to be on TV when you have a story, other times it's not. I think it's every day when you come in saying I've got, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours today and what am I going to achieve and really sticking with it because it, it's, it's changed so much and I think this, just the cult of TV and of personality has transformed our business. Um, some, some good things and some not so good things. I, I, and reporting and investigating this uh, administration, especially uh, maybe disregarding the tax returns, um, but especially when you take into account that almost bi-weekly something comes out that would have taken down any other normal administration. I think it is a challenge because I think the, the and I, I think sometimes the White House is very effective at changing the topic, but I think stories that you would think would have a huge impact um, often disappear. And, and I still think though that these stories do have an impact and sometimes, you know, when you see one that doesn't, I think you still have to remember we're writing the first cut of history and this right. stuff is going to matter. In fact, still matter to a lot of people. They may not matter to some of the people that have the largest megaphones, but they matter to a lot of people. I'm never going to give up on that and I'm not going to stop trying just because sometimes the story I write doesn't get a lot of press or I don't get on CNN or CNBC or MSNBC about it. I think people are going to remember it and I think people are going to look back at this time and I think the good journalism that's done is going to be, is going to be remembered. And, and storified in, in ways that you know we maybe don't know now. But I still think, I just think people do value this stuff. I, I really do. I think you know there's a small. I think it's a smaller group that's maybe just more vocal, that's able to drown it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right here. Uh, when you said that the increased security at the New York Times was a positive factor of the hate speech that comes out of the White House. I was wondering if you were referring to Trump's like fake news mantra in particular or something other than that. I think a lot, I think, no, I think it's, you know, there's a correlation, he, you know, just the repetition that we are the enemy of the people. I mean, I think there's a lot of threats that come in that didn't before. A lot of them are directly related to coverage that we have done on Trump. You know, the president has stated we're the enemy of the people. It's a pretty powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any real feedback that you change people's minds? I mean, 
we, we all like to think that those stories change people's mind. Do you ever hear people saying, gosh, you know, I was a rather Trump fan, and now I've read your story. <laughs> Do you, do, you, do you feel like you're gaining ground here? Uh, the question is, do you ever hear from people that what you have done has changed lives? And do, do changed you get minds, changed minds? Sorry. Okay, I need to get some hearing aid. Um, changed minds. I've never thought. I've never. Uh, I directly no. I, mean, I think we heard from a lot of people after the the story ran that we did into um, his family and the family finances in the tax fraud. I think that affected a lot of people and brought to light a lot of things um, that they didn't know. And I, I think the power of that and, and the response to it was partly rooted in the fact that the story was based largely on tax documents and bank records from their family and depositions from their family. So I think the response to that was, I think, an enlightenment about um, about it from a lot of corners. Have I heard directly from from Trump supporters that it changed their mind in terms of a vote? No, but I, I just don't even, I don't filter things that way, so maybe that's the thing. But I, I think a lot of people had a response to that, and a lot of people were, were surprised by some of the things in that story. Mm -hmm. And again, the documentation really helped in terms of the transparency and the, and the credibility of it. I actually, I know that was a question about Trump, but strangely, I have one example of this, which has to do with documentation making the, all the difference, which was, uh, that story that I mentioned, if Bobby talks, I'm finished, was a very well-documented account of an extortion attempt, right? Or an attempted extortion attempt, or blackmail, whatever you want to call it. And because we had all of these, oops, sorry, uh, because we had all these text messages between uh, Les Moonves and the manager, um, and because we had uh, uh, tr um, we had notes, notes from different lawyers, and we had all kinds of of, of documents, um, I heard from a lot of people who said, who, who maybe were in Hollywood, maybe they knew Moonves, and they said, you know, when I read Ronan Farrow's story, not to, this, those were great stories, but these are people that know him, right? They might have been, even have been his friends or people that really respected him. They said, when I read the stories in The New Yorker, a lot of those accusations, it was, it was only based on verbal accounts for the most part that were corroborated, and I just, they were from 30 years ago, but when I read that story and I saw the text messages, when I mm -hmm. saw the notes, like that's what really changed my mind. And it really speaks to what Sue was saying. Like, you know, I, I wish that everybody would read something and, and believe it because we, we only write stuff that we're confident in, but, but the more evidence you have, the more documents you have, that extra step that you go to get that stuff, I mean, it really, that's, I feel like in some cases, what changes people's minds. I think that that's the response that we got from that piece, what's the power of it was the, the documentation that we had from inside their family and the depositions that we had. Yeah, I mean, it's documents are just so powerful when they're from the people that you're writing about. And it was hard to refute it, and they didn't. Yeah. We have time for one more. Uh, how did you approach the issue of the credibility of the tax return uh, papers? Like, how did you figure out that they're fake or real? Like, what was the process behind that? We did a lot of different things. In the case of the first one, where we spent. That, you know, where we got them in, in October or September 2016, we ended up, as I mentioned, we had the accountant who had signed them, went down and he confirmed a lot of the information. And then in our dealings with the White House in that instance, um, we came away with that interaction, believing that they were, they were real. And we went to press on the, we didn't have any doubts in terms of the, um, the, inv the 18 month investigation that we did. We knew the source of the documents. Um, and there was just a lot of information that supported their credibility. When we got the um, the, IR, the, the information um, pertaining to the IRS transcript, we spent six or seven months going through public data, and then we had a lot of confidential data about the Trumps um, because of the prior investigation that we had done that we were able to you know, look at that transcript and verify different lines. Um, and we also did things like we could see in cases Donald Trump had gotten royalties, and we knew what that royalty was from, and we knew if somebody had shared, you know, we, let's say it was a royalty where he had gotten half of it, we knew who the other person was, and we would phone them and ask them for their tax information. Sometimes we got it. So we just kept kind of phoning and trying new things, and then ultimately, um, the other thing we did, I mentioned it earlier, was we were able to get anonymized tax information, and because we had a taxpayer's information, we were sort of able to back engineer the document we had into anonymized information and it matched perfectly. 
So all of these things gave us a level of confidence to be able to go to press. All, every situation sort of different and we try different things. Um, yeah, but once you, it's interesting for wh what we do, and I'll, I'll end on this, is once you have tax information, it's a little bit easier to get people to cooperate with you because sometimes you can phone and you can say, I've got you know, this tax return and can I have you know, his gross income from you know, 19, 1992? And they'll read you one line, and if it matches, you know, that's confirming of at least that line. But you, you can, I think there's just a different dialogue with your sources when you actually have information. That's always good as a reporter to remember that, because just how you approach something in the morning is different depending on what you have and how one much information you have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's sometimes how we do it with them. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both thank so much. Thank you for much. having us yes, and for coming. Yes, it's our pleasure.